your friends were in it, you might tag them. Even if your friends aren't in it, you might tag them. Um, and like as I mentioned earlier, it used to be you would share with everybody who was a follower of yours. Now, if you see over the far right hand side, there's a thing called direct. So if you click on direct, you can specifically just send your image to a handful of you know people from your followers list. So it wouldn't show up, and it would be more like a specific message to to those followers. Um, other things to note in this sort of image of the share profile is um, adding to your photo map. So I'll uh, address that in just a second, but the photo map is basically putting a, a, a geo tag on, on where that picture is taken, and that becomes part of your profile. Um, you can name that location, so if you want people to know you're in the Darien Library, that is actually different than, than having your photo map turned on. And then in addition to sharing all this, you can click and have it post also to your Facebook account, your Twitter account, you can email it. Um, if you, you can't see it on here, but it also could go to a Flickr page. So most of these networks like for you to also then take whatever you're sharing here and share it in a million different places. Um, and the other thing to note is it does save also, or you can choose in your settings on your mobile device to have it save in your photo gallery. So if you have made a pretty artsy fartsy picture, you get to save it as well in case you want to have it um, have it later. Um, relevant to people who are here wanting to know about tweens and what their options are and opportunities, um, uh, Instagram does offer, I mean, or, or does give you the choice of having a public profile or, or a private profile. So if you choose to have a private profile, this is what you would see if you are not already following some, somebody. So you would go and see basically their bio and their name. You would be able to see how many followers they had or posts they had, but you wouldn't be able to see anything else. So you, and you wouldn't actually be able to see who their followers were or who they were following. So if you wanted to let, be friends with somebody who was private, you would say you wanted to be friends with them, they would get a message and they would ask you, I mean they would then give you permission or not to follow them. So this is what a, a, a private profile looks like. If this were public, where it says this user is private, you would see all of the images that that person had. You'd also be able to see, again, who they were following and who was following them. Um, and having said, I'm just going to pre present the facts. I, I, I think, you know, as a, as a parent for tween, it makes sense to have private. You, you just don't need complete strangers following you when you're 10 years old. <laughs> yes? Nancy, um, the geo tag, going back to the last slide, what does that actually do? Does it tell people where they are located when they took the picture? Funny or? you should mention that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, so this photo map, you know, while it's fun for you and you can go look and see that, oh, look, I have pictures here and I had pictures here, it's great. Um, I tested this last night on a 10-year-old who I know who had a public profile and went in and basically I could tell you exactly where she lived by the 28, you know, the majority of her photos had been posted from her house and if I scrolled in like this, I could tell you basically where her house was. Um, so, and then she'd also posted a picture saying it was her 12th birthday. So it was, a, and again, I'm just taking the facts, but it was a public, she had a public profile, she had a picture of her 12th birthday cake and I could tell you where she lived. Um, so that's the reason I advise at least for, you know, turning the photo map off or on occasion. Let's say you do want to go say you're at Wimbledon, great. But you can turn it off on a picture-by-picture on a, on a, um, picture basis so that they don't all show up. But it becomes pretty evident if you've left it on where you're doing most of your, you know, doing most of your picture sending from. Right. Uh, uh, we I've tested that, and, and I, I have to say we can I would retest it. But if it's hashtag, but somebody is following you, uh, who's in your group and it's private, they could see you. But in theory, if you've hashtagged it and you have a private, it shouldn't be showing up in a public, uh, in, in let's say a public search under that hashtag. Uh, but I'd re test that you know, with a random one just to make the case. 
that that should be the case. And, and hashtag, for those of you, you know, a hashtag is basically kind of identifying your image. So let's say there's a picture of you guys on the beach and you just write hashtag beach. Uh, if you have a public profile, anybody who's on Instagram who went to search hashtag beach could also see your image showing up in that feed. So that's another reason, you know, at least from a tween perspective, it might make sense to, to have a, a, a private profile. Um, that was kind of a quick overview. I'm going to keep walking short. Go ahead. So the hashtag is just a slug if you give the photo so people can find that particular photo. Exactly. And the hashtag is, you know, the, uh, the, the number sign. But, but that would show up and you put it in your comments or sometimes other people might, you know, put it in the comments. So if you put a hashtag on something, it's not a sort. It doesn't sort through like, if you're going, it's not like a filter. So if I did like hashtag Darian Library, what would come up? If you did hashtag Darian Library, any other photo on Instagram that had been tagged, hashtag library would show up. So, you know, for example, um, I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, you did hashtag DHS, hashtag midterms, we wouldn't see a bunch of kids sitting, you know, in the library slaving over their, you know, their books, assuming those were, were sort of public views. Is it comment that's posted on a photo the same thing as hashtag? No, so a comment, let me go back, oops, sorry. Um, so a comment, let's see if I had one where, you can't see it on this image, but, but so once you, see, once you see an image, if you're looking just at Instagram, um, you can then comment on other people's photos. So, and if you're um, following them, you can, but if it's a public, if, it's, if you have a public profile, anybody can comment on yours. And within the comment, you could put a hashtag if you wanted to. So somebody could sort of re-identify your image if it, was, if it was public. So again, with public, you don't have quite the same control over your images as you would if it was private. I'm sorry, again, on the photo map, can you just set it so it doesn't jump on any pictures, or is it per photo? I'm sorry, what was the... Ideally, if we're, if we're here in the sharing image, it just, you default, I mean, it, it's, it should be on off. Right now, it's, I think it's, this makes it look like it's on. Okay, so you can turn it off. Per picture, then you can. Yeah, exactly, that. exactly. So on occasion, I can see the occasion you want to sort of show it. But, but for the most part, I, I'm very conscious if I'm sitting in my house or somewhere I don't, you know, I want to turn it on. OK, yes. If a kid's uh, had a public account and you ask them to switch to a private, will all their followers stay with them? Yes. Or Yes, so they don't leave it. But then you sort of have closed the door to sort of say the world doesn't now need to see what's what's going on here. Yeah, and I'm going to. Um, I, I know that some teens use hashtags to acquire followers. Also, if they're it, into uh, having a public account, right. they put lots of hashtags oh, yeah. under their photos. Absol absolutely. And their pictures out all over in the public domain. So as people search those hashtags, they'll follow. So if you see your tweener team that has, you know, 800 followers, right. they're putting themselves out there like crazy uh, to acquire. Uh, absolutely. And I've also seen in a lot of their, where was my sort of showing the, uh, the bio? Um, I've also seen teens and tweens will fill their bio with, please follow me, I'll follow you, please follow me, I'll follow you, or for 10 follows, you know, or they'll, you know, put, you know, in a photo, if you know me or like me, check this photo. So. So there's a, a lot of conversation now goes on, not just with the, you know, after you put a photo up, but, and sometimes the photo will go up and start conversations will start happening that have nothing to do with the photo, but, but that is a way, I mean, that's what marketers do as well. So, um, so that happens. I'm gonna do one more and we'll, uh, go ahead. Sorry, to the photo map, I know the under settings, so like on the iPhone, you can turn off the GPS. Right. Um, so does that, does that also turn off the photo map? That, that would do it, and it, would, it but the minute you sort of open it up, it's like, it would like to have your access to your location services. But yes, that's another way to, to control it is, I don't know if you heard the question, but, but literally turning off location settings on your phone in general helps to restrict this as well. All right. Um, so Snapchat, cute, friendly ghost, looking all cute and friendly, and um, Snapchat is, is, used to be just, again, another photo sharing app. It's also a video. It was launched um, less than two years ago. And um, what we've seen, or what was sort of in the news over the past several months, that, uh, again, this is another one of those, Karen, to your point, um, that the kids have rushed to because it's easy, it's instantaneous, 
parents aren't there. And, and the real appeal of Snapchat is the, um, is the way it works. Um, and when I have the, it's a lack of digital track. So, so Snapchat is, within the Snapchat app, you will take a picture and you will send it to somebody on your Snapchat contact list. And um, you, when you send it to them, can control how many seconds they have to look at it, one to 10. And when that time frame is up, that picture is gone. It's gone. So you now have the opportunity, or your children have the opportunity to send pictures that don't, you don't have a trail anymore. You don't have a list of pictures. You don't have uh, everything else. It's a sort of one-off, want to send you this funny thing, or here's a funny video, or just thinking of you. But, but it, it's, a, it's appeal to many is that there's no, there's, there's, there's no longer this digital, this digital footprint. I can be funny and cute and private, and the whole world doesn't have to know it. Moms doesn't have to see it, and we and, and I can do that. So, and the, the founders, to their credit, have said again back to the, the sort of it's a bit of a backlash to how how mammoth these other social networks have gotten, and they felt it was a call to sort of I just want to send this to like three people. I don't I don't need to announce to the world this proclamation. So. Um, uh, and, and from an industry standpoint, I don't know if you saw the news, but Facebook offered last fall, early winter, to, to buy Snapchat for $3 billion, has no revenue. And uh, Snapchat's like, no thanks, we're fine, we, you know, we're, we're, we're doing okay by ourselves. Um, the age policy for Snapchat, and also for Instagram, is, uh, is 13 plus. So if you go on their policy page, um, it says, uh, they say, if you are under 13, you absolutely should not have an account. Please delete it immediately, and you should look into Snap Kids. Um, now, as I was signaling to John, I just heard of Snap Kids when I was doing this research. So I don't think it's necessarily taken off. I would assume it's a simpler version with lots of parental controls on it where you know, one can do it. But it looks like they're at least addressing this concern of, of people, you know, of, the, of the kids being on there. And when these apps, have age policies, there's not really an enforcement. All, all, and all that means, and with most of these, all you need is an email account and a username. You can go complete your profile and fill it all out if you want to, and that's where you'll find when they ask for your birthday, they don't offer, you know, sort of cut off dates for anybody who's 10 or younger. That's how they state their age policy. But there's no, it's not enforced. So, so again, with all of these, an email and a username, is basically all, all you need to, to open an account on any of these. Um, we may have just covered this, but so Snapchat, you can take a picture. It also has a drawing feature in it. So you'll take your picture in Snapchat, and there's a crayon, and so you can write doodles, and love notes, and hearts, or mustaches. And, um, and as I said, you then control, do I want this person to see it in one second, 10 seconds, three seconds? And um, you send it. And then you can see, you know, when the person's viewed it and, and when it's disappeared, and um, that's it. It's a it's a quick transaction. And I was saying the appeal is there's not a digital trail. This is a one-off. I'm communicating. I'm going to you, so Patty. No way to I was out of the room, but did you talk about how Snapchat was hacked this past weekend? It's coming up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're, you're at me. Sorry. So so with Snapchat, there's no way to actually save the picture. So and then it yeah. goes, and then yeah. you're like, how do you prove yeah. it? Yeah, right, because right, right. Because it's here and gone. Right. Can't you take a screenshot? Because you guys can teach the yeah. class. So, to your point, anybody, anybody who has sent the so sent the photo can take a you know. I don't know if you know what I say with a screenshot, but a screenshot is when you actually take a picture on your phone of the image you're looking at. Snapchat now has put a mechanism in that notifies the sender that the person has taken a screenshot. So if you do send something you really didn't want to get out there, but the person who received it took a picture anyway, the sender now knows you've done it. But there is nothing to stop you from holding another picture to take a picture of that when it comes through. So the, the illusion of no digital footprint is an illusion. And, and my son was looking at this and he goes, and mom, you think Snapchat doesn't have all those pictures? And I said, well, e exactly. But, and I think the reaction to Snapchat as it came out was, well, what are all these things you could be sending? And you know, and there's no way, to, you know, if you can't see it and prove that somebody's done it, and or, you know, the conversation would go to each other. Well, why do you want to be on Snapchat? Because all my friends are on Snapchat. But why can't you just send a text? And you know, 
this is, you know, if I could present <coughs> 16 different articles of Snapchat and the next word would be sexting, you know, because that, that's sort of what it was getting its reputation for. Um, I was just saying to John, it's a balance. Uh, you know, our children also do deserve some privacy, so how do you gauge and walk this fine line of letting them have some privacy and some private jokes and some, you know, some conversations and communications with their friends when you're not sitting on top of them? I'm not sure this is necessarily the way, but I, I can very easily see why this is appealing to, you know, and its growth has taken off. Um, and back to your point, <laughs> Patty, um, Snapchat evidently was quite relaxed about you know, how easy it was to work. And, and there was a, a warning that came through the, in terms of your security Snapchat's looking a little bit light. And the Snapchat's like, no, we're fine, we're fine, we're fine. And it was just before Christmas, right, Patty? I was out. I mean, it was literally just over Christmas time. Um, they, were, they, were, they were hacked. And um, because Snapchat is basically not much more than a cell phone and I mean, cell phone numbers and, and usernames, uh, it, it was a bit of a serious hack in terms of they were also accessing people's address books because that's where you were finding your friends on Snapchat by accessing the, the phone numbers on your, um, on, your, on your smartphones. So, um, and then there was another, something came out yesterday, I think I saw, and Snapchat was saying, no, no, this has nothing to do with the hacking. Don't worry, you know, well, all of this um, um, spam that you're seeing has nothing to do with the hacking. So. <laughs> Again, even if you're just understanding how these accounts work and how they get set up and what you know risks there are inherent, you are a step ahead of the game just in, in, in understanding what they are and um, and how they work. All right, good to go. I'm going to Vine. Um, Vine is a social network where you can upload and view six-second videos that loop over and over again. Do you know what I mean? When it says loop over and over again, like it just it plays. So you know, it's not like you watch it and it's over. It is this, and you're thinking six seconds. What on earth can you cover in six seconds? It is unbelievable what people can do <laughs> in six seconds. Um, it is owned by Twitter. It has over over 40 million um, users. As with these other ones, you know, there's a whole sharing component of followers and everything else. Uh, to post or view a Vine, you need an account which requires either email or a Twitter account. Vine, as opposed to Snapchat or Instagram recently changed its rating to 17 plus, and that has to do with a lot of the content being very inappropriate um, and, and ordering sort of um, porn and adult related content, a lot of bad language and um, everything else. So, so that has changed to, to 17 plus. Again, there is nothing going on to enforce it. That's just what they have said should be the rating given the content that's showing up on Vine. Um, and typical videos, I'm sorry I can't show you, but you know, there's a lot of physical comedy where people are walking into walls or you know, it's, people use the actual medium to do tricks with their phone in terms of making things disappear or things. It, it, there are some things on there, very funny. There's a lot. You think you never want your children. You know, you don't, you're like, I don't need that. That's okay. It's fine. Um, Vine does have, like Instagram, a privacy option so you can have a more of a private profile. Your posts are protected. It doesn't protect you from seeing others, but your, your information can be protected and, and be in a private mode so people can't see you. Um, and I, I mean, I, as you can see, you know, there's an option here to check, is this a sensitive post? But if I'm flipping through what they're showing is sort of up and coming vines, there does not appear to be any sort of rating or filtering system. And back to the hashtags, everybody uses hashtags. So, Yesterday, I just happened to click, you know, one of the trending hashtags. I forget. It's I don't know, New York City something. I didn't get it. There was just a lot of garbage, a lot of garbage, a lot of garbage, and you know that was on the um, the home page. So they do have channels if you want to go to the Discover and see family and things, and uh, you know, or there was cats and there was magic tricks and special effects. But um, again, with a hashtag, you can identify your or somebody else can identify their vine and put it in completely unrelated places and you might end up, um, you might end up seeing them. Um, another recent option with Vine is um, you can revine, which is similar to retweet, and that is if you like somebody's Vine that they posted, all you click is revine and that shows up in your feed. So it might be something totally unrelated to you or your child, but they think it's funny, so they put it in their feed so their followers will see them. So if my child only has five friends, 
put something out there, but one of their friends reposts. Now, do all their friends have access to my child's video? If he revined it and he has a public, I believe yes. Okay, I'm gonna. I would say yes. If he has public access and he's revined it, yes. I'm gonna double check on that. But so. so how do you prevent? I mean, then you're one step away from being public again. Right. Yeah, uh, yes. Um, I'm going to double check on that one and get back to you. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, it's not like Snapchat, but like Instagram and, and with YouTube, the focus, especially if you put yourself in a teen or tween mind, is more followers, more likes, more subscribe, you know, and that instant gratification of, you, you know, you're sort of going up against a battle of, well, how many likes did you get on that photo? Or how many, you know, how many subscribers do you have? Um, Vine, Snapchat, and Instagram are only on phones or mobile applications. It can be an iPad. YouTube is the only one that's actually on a computer. It's not true. Sorry? It's not true. You can go on all of them. Well, at least I know you can go on Instagram on a computer because I've got one that's on it. You can see images. You can't post from Instagram. You can see images. So you could go to somebody's profile and say, you know, she saw, sorry, to your credit, you could actually see some of the images. But in terms of being able to, and you might even be able to like some photos, but I don't think you're able, you might be able to like. Um, I think you can like and comment, but I think the actual posting still has to occur from your mobile application. So, sorry, you, I, yeah, so, so. Um, so if I wanted to check any of this stuff out, could I go onto the computer to look at the, I mean, I don't want to like scroll through my, I don't want to do any of those, but can I eavesdrop on the computer to see some of these things? You can't, you would have to have an account, I think you would have to have an account, um, and if it was, let's say, a child, you would have to be following them to see their information, um, and probably be able to see what's, but you, yeah, you would have to be, they would have have to given you permission to follow them if they have a private. If it's public, you might be able to find them and see it. Um, did that answer your question? Okay. Um, yeah. they and find I don't think so. I know Twitter has just come out with, again, the same feature where you can post. Um, Twitter came out about the same time that Instagram did, where you can do it uh, directly to one or two people. But at this point, I don't think Vine has created that option. Are we good? Yeah. Y yes. If you have a list of all your child's passwords, names, passwords, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Sometimes there's the you want to go see what your child is doing from a public perspective before you do that. But yes, absolutely. Um, and then YouTube sort of is the granddaddy. You know, I think you, you you've all seen granddaddy, and it has a, a slightly different feel. If you, if you look at YouTube on your phone, it does feel more like these other apps. But I would assume everybody here has probably actually even sat with your child and seen something on YouTube because there's also, you know, there's not, as, as much as there's a lot of things you might not want to see, there's some awesome things on YouTube in terms of how-to and creativity and, you know, it's, it, it, it is an amazing resource. So, um, and again, from perspective, if you didn't know, it's owned by Google. So it has all of those reaching fingers that Google has, whether it's through, you know, Gmail and apps and Google Plus and uh, Google Docs. So, uh, it's part of that, that rhythm. I mean, it's part of that sort of figuring everything, um, wanting to connect to everything. You do not have to have an account to view YouTube videos as opposed to these others. Um, it is now becoming, as you see, a main source of actually entertainment and, and videos for uh, this, this younger age group. Um, again, YouTube sharing users view, comment, like, if you actually We've sort of moved from where you have an account and you're posting stuff to becoming more of a voyeur and looking at stuff, but still understanding some people do have YouTube's account, do have YouTube accounts. You can't comment or share on YouTube unless you have an account yourself. It'll ask you to log in. Um, and all, with on the mobile device, so YouTube does have its um, its own um, sort of safe search as well as Google has a safe search and then within YouTube. So I was, my understanding is if you put safe search with, within Google across the board, it should affect the, um, the search abilities on um, YouTube, but it, 
I wouldn't necessarily trust it. It also has it here. If you are posting information on YouTube, you have an option of three different settings. Public, unlisted, and private. Um, private is truly private, and you've only given somebody the actual link to find it. Unlisted means it's just not searchable. So you're not going to show up in people's feeds. It's there, but somebody can't find you as easily as it's public, and it becomes part of the this, this sort of involved in the search. Um, you know, it's easily found and searchable. So wait, I, yep. is that all just if you have a YouTube account? Or can I go on my computer and make it so that my daughter can't search? Because no one has in my house a YouTube account. Yeah, so that's sort of two different questions. So the, the filtering you can set, and I would advise going in to Google itself right. first and, and putting the safe search on, and then making sure when you're on YouTube that you've turned safe search on as well. It should automatically by default. You don't have to have an account. Um, you do have to have some kind of a Google account. It doesn't have to be YouTube. That's the reason I would say go do it with Google over, the overreaching Google. You have to have some kind of a Google account. It doesn't have to be a Gmail. It just has to be some kind of Google account. But I advise doing that also for just Google searches in general, no matter what. Can you explain then what is safe search? What does that mean? What does it do? What age appropriate? Yeah, and I meant to, I should have copied it down, but they just sort of filter out words and content that have either been flagged by the, by the people who put it out there themselves or the, the sort of Google themselves has sort of said, well, we're going to take it down. It, it, they, when I was looking, it sort of tends to be a 17 or 18 differentiation. So safe searching dictated by an 18-year-old mentality, not by you can't go in and say 10 years old, 13 years old, 16 years old. It's kind of a over 18, below 18. Um, oh, and sorry, to answer your question, I also saw this was, um, this was, I, I haven't actually seen this in, a, in, in play, but Google says it has a content rating system. I think this has to do with a lot of stuff that might be actually being produced, like television programs and things, to give you a sense of, is it G, P, G, or, or R? So they've said green, yellow, and red, and then they have tags after that that'll say language violence or sex and nudity. That is coming from YouTube because I think a lot of uh, what's happening now is people are actually producing television shows and pro I mean, producing video programs or producing content and releasing it solely on. So in order to do that, they are, you know, if they're sort of doing wide mass distribution, that's, this is YouTube. Again, I don't know how many people are coming through sort of saying, oh, I got a lot of bad stuff here. Don't look, don't look, don't look. I, I don't know, but, but there's a reporting system in terms of blocking and reporting content. Um, I'm going to keep skipping, but this was just sort of, and then, in case you didn't get it all, um, this was kind of a, a, here's how we, you know, here's how the four compare against each other for having a conversation. Um, I have a handout of this down here if it, if it might be helpful, um, but to, to sort of clarify, um, where they are, where to find them, and, and what goes. And, and I kind of view this as it goes, as I said, from Instagram being a, a proactive, you're posting stuff at Snapchat, to sort of moving to Vine and YouTube where you're more of a voyeur and a watcher as opposed to a poster. But again, you can do that at all of those. Um, other apps and networks that you may be hearing about uh, to be aware of, Ask FM, where you can ask anonymous questions. Uh, Path is one that's sort of a more smaller, intimate network. Glimpse, I don't know, Pam, you'd mentioned that. That's where you sort of share your location for a short period of time, like on my way, and somebody can see that you're coming from the train station. Um, Kick Messenger is just a free texting app, and What App is another one that are texting apps. So again, if your kids are on iPods, they have access to texting features without having a phone number. I don't know if you know that, but you know, they can they can text. There's also text now. So as long as they have access to wireless, they can be texting their friends. So um, commentary, public versus private. I'm going to say go private. Um, and then giving advice to your children, only letting people know you follow you, turn off location services. Um, I personally don't link everything together or sign up with different accounts through other ones because I never quite am clear about if I'm doing something on this network, is it reporting it to that network? So I, my advice is to actually have different logins for each one so that you can connect 
them on the back end, but not go in. Don't don't link them all together when you set them up. If you do it, um, don't post anything you wouldn't want your mother-in-law, your grandparents, or your cousin to see. Um, and and again, here just a little a few tips about talking to your kids. A clear understanding. You know, you now are empowered. You now have got some information. I, I, sit down with your kids. Why do they want to be on it? Tell me what. How do you think it works? Do they, they might just want to be on it and have no sense of what it is. So you know, this is actually a learning opportunity. Um, discuss your rules. Discuss you know content. And um, I just saw yesterday a friend. She has she has a social networking contract with her son. And for you know each one of these, they have clearly stated. You know, here's the behavior. Here's when you can be on it. Here's where you go. You're signing it. I'm signing it. Here, it's, it is all laid out. And if you learn things that I don't know and you get ahead, that doesn't mean that it's okay to do it. We bring it back to the conversation, and uh, and start. So you're here. You know, you're here. Don't be overwhelmed. It's a great way to be. I mean, a, a great place to start. And you know, I feel like it's a it's a, it's a conversation with your kids. Um, again, there's a resource thing down here. I'm sorry, I'm rushing, but I'm worried about. John having his time to get up here. So we'll have time for more questions. I just want John to get to the to games. Thank you. OK, so um, one thing that is useful to do is to kind of think about um, you know, your kids' online uh, experiences as sort of being part of an ecosystem. And, um, and uh, gaming is part of that ecosystem. So. Uh, it, it's really important because I'm sure all of you have who have kids are you know they're online and they're playing games and um, and, uh, and and you're concerned about that because these are areas where they're interacting with other kids and um, and, and you want to know sort of what that's like what they're doing what they're up to and and those sorts of things um, but online gaming has been around for a while um, when I was uh, uh, you know, probably in high school, high school age or so, um, in college, uh, MUDs were the were the big thing. Has anybody heard of MUDs? So these were um, sort of text-based games. They looked like this. You used something called Telnet to just connect to another computer on the internet, and you would log in, and um, you know, you would have sort of this experience that looked like this. Which now, if you put this in front, you know, and I have, I've, I've brought up uh, screenshots of MUDs with my kids, and they. They've said, "What is that? Is, why would you do that? Why would you sit in front of that?" But, you know, so, um, but really, you know, uh, it, it, when it comes down to it, it's about um, these these games creating immersive environments, and that's exactly what's happening when your kids get online and they're playing an online game. They are uh, they are being immersed, and um, immersion is sort of the holy grail of gaming, um, especially online gaming. Um, so when when you uh, when you read reviews of games um, that have come out, and the reviewer says a highly immersive experience, um, you know that that is a very very high compliment. Um, so uh, what what creates immersion, and and, and that's sort of uh, that that's sort of one of those intangible things. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some of the more popular games. There are literally thousands of online games um, that, that are out there. And some of them are very obscure to very popular. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the ones that, that are, are more popular and um, so that, A, you can get a sense of what's out there and um, what your kids might be interested in um, or what they, what they might be doing. Um, and then also, I want to just kind of want to give you a sense of sort of what what kinds of experiences you can expect your kids to have um, if they get into online gaming and um, and what kind of choices they they, they may make and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, you had a, a question. Well, I just, so when you talk about online gaming, are you talking specifically about like sitting at the desktop and logging onto the site, or is that the same as you know my kids are not into online? Right. Yeah. Well, the it's they're they're similar, um, and I'm going to talk about different types. So, um, and that's a really good question because to your child, the the piece of technology is really just the gateway into what they're trying to do. Um, they're agnostic as to what the device is. If it's a laptop, if it's a if it's a handheld, if it's a 
if it's a gaming console, um, they don't really care. Um, it's really all about how do I get into this experience and, and be a part of it. Um, so, uh, so, so that's a really good question. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about all. I'm going to talk about computers versus mobile games versus console games too. Um, so Animal Jam is is one that, and I'm kind of I've kind of arranged these by age, sort of by in um, in terms of what you know. As your younger kids will sort of get into these games, and as they get older, you'll you'll kind of get a sense of, of where they go. So Animal Jam is uh, created by National Geographic Kids. Um, and it is uh, basically you have a player name, you log in, and you have these sort of spaces that you can go to or travel to. And you have these kind of uh, little characters that look like little creatures, and you can kind of choose what kind of creature you want to be. Um, you can kind of play these mini games, go around and chat to people, and, um, and, and it's really sort of designed for the younger kid. Um, and. Uh, and again, you go online. Uh, there, are, there are. It's it's a it's a fairly safe environment. It's monitored. You know, it's filtered and that sort of thing. Um, oops. And then you get to something like uh, Pop Tropica, which is created by Jeff Kinney, and most of you know. Uh, yeah. No, it's just funny because it kind of is what prompted me to come this morning. Was so, but I remember my daughter was on Animal Jam with friends uh -huh. and. Yeah. Like, isn't that National Geographic? Oh right, yeah. Like, there's no way. Of, I mean, I was glad that she was like, we were like, okay, we're getting off because we don't know who this person is, and they're, you know, being inappropriate. But I don't know. There's just no. Right. Well, what, what tends to happen is, you know, you'll have like an eight year old or a seven year old who has an account, um, and they're fooling around, and then sometimes their older sibling will get on and be like, I'm going to go in here and, and sort of troll around, um, and they do, and that's exactly, and, and that's that's the term is trolling, you know, which is going in and really kind of being, you know, this big ugly troll and kind of saying stuff, and um, and that happens, you know, and typically there are there are often safeguards in place to um, to to deal with that, but they're not perfect, you know, and so sometimes there's bullying that happens. Um, and there's name calling and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, that is definitely part of this whole ecosystem, which is, um, you know, unfortunate, but it's also something that your kids have to learn to deal with if they're going to be online playing these things. So, if you're playing Animal Jam, you can't do it just with your friends. Right. Animal Jam is a, a massive multiplayer online game, um, and as most of these are. Um, there are there are some games where. Um, where you can choose or go, you know, you know, connect to one person directly, um, and those are sort of a different kind of breed. So I'm, I'm kind of focused on sort of these massive multiplayer online uh, games. So Pop Tropica is, is another one of these um, games, and uh, designed by Jeff Kinney, and um, it really has kind of that uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid look and feel. Um, and it's arranged into islands, so you're, you can kind of choose which island you have. And each island has a different look and feel, different kind of, uh, you know, different vegetation, different architecture, that kind of thing. Um, again, the, these mini games are are popular, and this is often how you um, sort of earn in-game currency to purchase things, to, to kind of deck out your avatar and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, Pop Tropica, like many of these games, have in-game purchases, which is something that you need to be aware of, um, because um, if your child is 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 involved in these games, it's, chances are they'll be hitting you up for uh, money to buy, you know, coins or you know, little jackets or armor or whatever. Um, and to them, I think the thing to realize is that to them, these are really, these are tangible things that, that are um, important to them. Um, 
whereas you know the first time my kids asked me you know can I can I get some money to or can I spend my money on um, getting some gold coins <laughs> You know, well, what are you getting out of this? You're not getting anything. Like, you're not getting this anything physical. You're just getting sort of this this virtual currency, and um, and I think that's sort of for many parents that's a that's a difficult hurdle to to overcome because it's you know it seems like a waste of money, but to them it's really important, and so you kind of have to balance balance that and, and, and find a way to kind of talk to them about what it is they're actually purchasing and and let them and get them to understand that they're not actually purchasing anything tangible but they are purchasing this virtual stuff so um, and that's a, that's a really um, kind of um, strange and and not easy conversation to have with an eight-year-old <laughs> you know uh, when you're talking about those sorts of concepts um, and then Fantage is another one that's uh, very big right now. And uh, Fantage's big uh, claim is that it has, that it's very focused on safety. Um, and it has what they call this three-tiered safe child safety system that includes, you know, um, stop words, um, uh, in-game monitoring by Fantage staff, and um, sort of this, uh, you know, uh, identification of, of players and, and verification systems. So, um, this this is a good option for people who really want to say, you know, really want to have that peace of mind. But bearing in mind that peace of mind is always relative when you're talking about online. Um, it's also very very popular with 16 million registered users, um, and uh, and again, in-game purchases are big. So. Um, you know, you'll be hit up for Fantage bucks. And then Wizard 101 um, has been around for a while, but it's starting to gain traction. And uh, for many kids, this is sort of the <coughs> um, first foray into sort of traditional role-playing RPG-type games where there are wizards and spells and 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 combat. Um, and I think. And the, the whole idea of sort of online combat is something that you kind of need to also be talking to your kids about um, because it, it ranges in, in sort of um, the type of combat and also the severity and intensity of the violence and that kind of thing. Um, and, and it's something that you need to be aware of. Um, in this particular, with Wizard 101, you create a character, you start at a sort of a low level and, and you sort of hook up with teams and you play quests and you kill monsters and um, as, you, as you play more, you get more abilities and that kind of thing. Um, so, um, and, and this is really uh, one of those things where, you know, I mean, if you remember way back in the, 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 the 80s when D&D &D was a, a big deal, you know, um, you know, there were a lot of sort of scary stories back then saying D&D &D is going, you know, my my son became a Satanist because he was playing D&D, which, you know, which all turned out to be bunk, you know, but if you were to, to talk about your kids now and say, well, you know, my kids sit around and they create these really elaborate stories and, and they, they're super imaginative and they, and they kind of talk around and, you know, and, and it's like if that sort of thing you, you would think of as being really good, right? So, um, you know, but, so this is sort of an offshoot of that, you know, the, you know, the, the whole RPG concept um, is, is sort of born of that D&D age um, where sort of your, um, and, and this is where you do need to kind of um, uh, pay attention, uh, where your online identity or your character identity becomes sort of wrapped up in your own personal identity. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, your, your worth as a character within Wizards 101 or whatever game you're playing is often tied to your own self-esteem. Um, and those are the sorts of things that you need to kind of be aware of and, and kind of talk to your kids about. Um, maybe there's a question over here. What is, I'm sorry, what is PVP? Uh, PVP, great question. Um, and if you see acronyms on here that I, I, I meant to explain that, um, uh, just, just let me know. PVP means player versus player. So um, there are, 
you know, there are different types of sort of in-game combat. One could be battling NPCs, which are non-player characters, <laughs> um, and others, and, and the other type is PvP, so where you can actually fight against other players online. Um, and that's a diff and both of those are totally different experiences, and uh, different players prefer different types of online combat. Um, and, uh, and, and so Wizards 101 introduces that in a very limited way um, by creating special areas where you can do it, where you can't just be kind of wandering around and somebody attacks you um, like you can in other games. Um, so uh, There's not a way to, there's not a setting for that. There, there's not a setting for that, but in the game, it's very clear where the areas where PvP is allowed are. Um, so you can't just inadvertently wander in to a space where um, you're going to be attacked. No, but it's the, whoever's playing, it's their choice. So if my eight-year-old is playing this game, she can go, if it's her, you know, without me knowing, basically. That's correct, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, who here hasn't heard of Minecraft? <laughs> um, <laughs> Minecraft is huge, um, and uh, it really, you know, it, it, it deserves its own kind of, um, you know, it, it, it's, and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's by the Swedish company uh, called Mojang, and um, it really is sort of this indie game, and the thing that's so, um, that, that really makes it popular uh, is that it, it is this sandbox uh, game. And the sandbox concept actually, um, you know, that it's not, it's not the first sandbox game, but the sandbox concept really basically means that you can do whatever you want. Um, you don't have to play a quest, you don't have to uh, um, reach an objective, you're just kind of plopped into this world that has its own kind of uh, physics and its own kind of rules and um, you can create, you can do whatever, you can interact. Um, there are sort of, there is sort of very mild violence in Minecraft um, in that you have these sort of cartoony creatures that sometimes explode. Um, there are these very non-threatening looking zombies that um, will sort of go after you and moan um, and, um, and they come out at night. Um, but you can build a shelter and you can put in you know, lights and stuff, and you can kind of protect yourself from that, and um, so, uh, you know, and, and so it's not, it's not at all a sort of threatening game in terms of gore and violence or anything. Um, the violence is very, very mild. Um, and you can play it single player, so you can play it, you know, without the internet, so you can log in, you can do your own world. Um, but most kids find that after a while, they want to have that interaction. They want to go online and be building with other people. Um, and um, literally, the types of servers that are out there range in, in are, are incredibly diverse. You know, some of them are focused on gaming, some of them are focused on PvP, some of them are focused on building, some of them are focused on um, just hanging out. Um, and. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's, it's very, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, deep and rich kind of uh, uh, ecosystem. So, um, and then, um, and the other thing is that, uh, is that they've opened up the sort of underlying uh, programming elements to it so that um, kids will often start programming because they want to create plugins and and add-ons to the Minecraft game, so they often will take it on their own initiative to start learning how to program in Java, and they'll go ahead and start programming uh, plugins. Um, and uh, uh, because my, the Minecraft makes its API or its application programming interface openly available, um, and that's sort of a model that um, you know that it's, it's very new in terms of. Um, uh, you know, being able to make those sorts of elements of the game available to the players um, and not making any assumption upon what the player wants, just saying, all right, this is your game, you know, you do with it what you want. 
And as a result, um, you know, there's, uh, that, that's one of the reasons why Minecraft is so wildly popular. That and, and the fact that it just you know, lets you do whatever you want to do. You can build these, um, these uh, you know, huge uh, uh, structures and, um, you know, and, and, and interact in them and that sort of thing. Um, we kind of recognize that as, as a very, we, we, we recognized early on that Minecraft was a very important kind of milestone in, in, in gaming and, and in terms of um, what it meant uh, to, to, the, to the players that, that, that were involved in it. And um, as a result, we actually host a Minecraft server here in the library. Um, that's an initiative that we took on. Um, and we've, we've extended that out to other Fairfield County libraries. So uh, participating libraries basically get their own world on this server. And um, all players, all the players on the, on the server who log into the server have to physically come into their, their hometown libraries, present their library card, and then they're kept on a, on a uh, private spreadsheet that we, that we share among, um, among the libraries. Um, but then they're allowed to log into the server. Before, before that, they're not allowed to. You just can't. It'll just say that this is a private server, basically. Um, and, um, and, and then the, the, the server is monitored by staff. You know, I'll, I might be on it at some point. Um, other Darian Library staff members might be on it. Um, there are staff members from other libraries that are on it. So there's usually a staff member around or near or, or on it. Um, we've, you know, um, over time, you know, we've sort of uh, brought in some players who were older and um, have demonstrated uh, you know, high, to be to be sort of highly mature, um, and we've given them sort of elevated access within the server to um, to help moderate and and be build uh, be builders and that sort of thing. Um, so we're trying to kind of craft this whole um, uh, sort of community uh, of Minecrafters in Fairfield County. Uh, in, in here and, and, and kind of create an environment where they can uh, feel safe and know that they're not going to be, uh, their, their buildings are not going to be knocked down, they're not going to be griefed, which is a term for um, destroying their online stuff. Yeah. So what's the difference between being on your server and just doing it for my computer at home? Is it like one big world where they're working together if they're on the server with you? Basically, it, it is. Um, and it's um, and, and it's actually several different worlds. Each town gets its own world. Um, so you build in your own world, and then there's some shared areas where there's some shared building going on. Um, whereas you, there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of Minecraft servers out there, and some of them you can connect to, and they're open, and then it's sort of like a free-for-all, and you have no idea who's, who's logged in. Um, we did a little bit of experimenting with the Minecraft server it, when we first did it. We, you know, I knew nothing about Minecraft servers, and I put this thing up, and then all of a sudden it was like a rabbit hole, and it was, you know, this huge, this huge learning curve. Um, but we had an open Minecraft server, um, but it was very problematic. We were getting a lot of people logging in, and we had no idea. I mean, people from like Germany, and you know, all this, and it was like, oh, we don't know. So we took that down. Um, we fought our way through it again, and we. Um, we created this, this Fairfield County server uh, because we wanted to widen it beyond Darien, but we wanted to kind of be able to still maintain control over it. Yeah? How are the, how are the kids finding all of these servers? Because like three boys can sit and then they'll find a server and then they wait. I guess there's a countdown yeah. for them to all join at the same time. But so, um, that's a good question. I mean, there are some sites out there like Minecraft, Minecraft servers on net, and um, they're, they're what that people sort of advertise. Um, and, and servers will go up and they'll come down a week later. You know, it'll be because these are like you know, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, are they thirteen, fourteen. Within, are they within the Minecraft? So if they just open Minecraft, are the servers there? No, you have to actually plug in the address. So you have to know what the address is. Um, and how does like, how how do my seven-year-old know to do that? <laughs> because <laughs> I'm sorry, really basic. Bring it, bring it down. So yeah. the Minecraft. So going back. Because do they, they have to go into a server, or they don't have to go into a server. Well, if they want to play online, they do. 
Um, so they, uh, they, you know, somebody at school will say, I found this really awesome server, you know, let me give you the IP address. And that's how they, that, it's sort of, it's, yeah, they write it down on a piece of paper and they say, they say, go on that, I'll meet you on there at 6 p.m., you know, I'll, I'll meet you on there after dinner. But they're in uh, kindergarten, then, can they just go on and just yeah. play it without a server? Yeah, they can go on and play without a server. Yeah, so um, so a lot of it is word of mouth. You know, it's sort of like, you know, I mean, these are like, you know, these kids are like little hipsters. They're like, let's. I found this server before anyone else did. You know, and so they and that's that they, you know, they, and then there are huge servers where they're literally like fifteen thousand players on at once. So it, it, it ranges. Um, yeah, and so <laughs> YouTube, the Minecraft YouTube um, phenomena is just, I mean, Minecraft does, you know, Mojang has never really, they, they don't provide any documentation because, um, you know, the kids do it all for them, you know. So we have our digital media lab here, and it's often, you know, occupied by kids down there who are doing Minecraft screencasts where they're, you know, logging in and doing a tutorial or something. So if you go on um, on YouTube and search Minecraft tutorial, there are literally hundreds of thousands of videos because that's sort of part of it, you know. And, uh, yeah. Well, they, 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 they go on Google and they say, how do I build a Minecraft server? <laughs> and they find the information and they do it. Um, and they're just doing it on a home computer. Yeah, they're just doing it on a home computer. And uh, it's, it's not difficult to get one up. But the thing about it is, is that they're learning sort of all these skills about you know, how the computer works and you know, what does this mean to put, open up a port and, and make it available to the internet. How do I nap that through on the router? You know, how do I you know, talk to mom or dad about getting access to the router so that I can do it? Um, you know, so it's, you know, and, and they're, they're just sort of, I mean, this is, this is what it means to be a digital native. I mean, these kids are digital natives because they are sort of in there and they, you know, they, they, they're, because they're, they have something that they want to accomplish, they, they do it. So, you know, like with my kids, if they say, you know, how do I do this? I don't, I mean, I'm in a position where I could tell them because I know, because it's my job to know sort of how technology works. But typically what I'll do is uh, I'll just say, well, you got to figure it out. You know, because it, it doesn't do them any favors to say, well, okay, I'll set that up for you. I'll do that for you because then, then they're not learning anything. That, those are the things that they need to learn. And, and gaming is, is basically, a, a, you know, it's always, it always has been a way to kind of make learning about these systems really fun. You know, when I, when I talked about these MUDs, you know, these were basically, um, you know, you wrote these in, in C. So C is not an easy language to learn, but if you wanted to have a MUD, you, you, basically, you had the basic software that was open source, but you still had to basically program it yourself. Um, and that's how a lot of people who then moved on to graduate as computer scientists first cut their teeth on learning to program C, which was, was doing this. Um, and that's just kind of the, you know, the way it goes, yeah. There's some software out there, I believe, that'll tell you how much time each your kid is spending in, in a particular application. Um, my the best way I know is just to kind of ask them or you know keep tabs on them <laughs> and, and see what they're doing. Um, and, and yeah, because they, they will, they'll get sucked into it and then they'll <laughs> spend the day, you know. Yeah. It depends. Um, you know, uh, I probably let them do it more than than a lot of parents, but um, 
I do make them take screen breaks and where there, there's no screen time at all, you know, whether that be the computer or the TV or the phone. Um, and, but, you know, increasingly it's more difficult to get them to go outside. It really is. So, yeah. What, what is the attraction of Minecraft? I mean, you showed the other games and there's a goal, right? Mm -hmm. Pop chocolate, there's a goal, you get something. But what is, what is attracting the kids to Minecraft? Um, I think the attraction to Minecraft is just sort of this basic human need to create, and um, and that's and it sort of just goes right to that and says, here are the tools for you to create, um, and um, here is a pristine world in which you can create, um, and uh, and that's something that you know that that really is appealing to to a kid. So, yeah. Um, the Xbox version of Minecraft, or yeah, just in, general. in general? Okay, well, I did have one game on here, and just in interest of time, I'm just going to kind of zip through here. I'm going to quickly talk about Roblox, and I'm going to talk about uh, Xbox in just a second. Roblox is sort of um, another uh, challenger to Minecraft, um, and it's vaguely similar to it. It looks a little bit like this. It looks like Lego. It literally looks like Lego. Um, and it's, they've also done something interesting, which is to integrate the Lua programming language into it, where um, you can create blocks where you have actually programmed what those blocks do and how they function. And you can upload those blocks, and other people can use them, um, which is a very interesting uh, way to, to kind of go about things. Um, it's a little bit more focused on combat and fighting and that kind of thing. Um, and again, and whereas Mo My uh, Minecraft, you pay 19 euros and that's it. You never pay anything again. Um, there's a lot of in-game purchases and uh, purchases that you can make for, for Roblox. So it's a totally different uh, uh, business model. Um, Gary's Mod, has anybody heard of this one? This one's really kind of bizarre. It's another sandbox. Oh, I spelled sandbox wrong. Uh, it's, just, uh, uh, <laughs> it's another sandbox game, um, which again is the sandbox the sandbox concept is very uh, popular, and it's available through an uh, online service called Steam, which you'll probably start hearing about as your kids get older. Um, and Steam is sort of like this underlying platform on which a lot of online games are sort of connected and integrated. Um, so uh, you can kind of um, sort of, it, 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 they don't actually produce the games, but they produce the platform on which multiplayer games connect. Um, so again, there's no game objectives, um, though as you can see, you're start, starting to get into a little bit of older um, uh, look and feel. Um, you know, your, your environment is manipulated using guns, and, and there are actual real guns in this where you can shoot and that kind of thing, but the, the guns that you use to manipulate your environment are these sort of weird looking things that, um, you know, basically you pick up and move things and, you know, pop objects in and out of existence using it. Um, and the thing that really creeps me out about this one is this ragdoll posing. It's sort of like you put these people into the game and they kind of flop there um, and you can do whatever you want with them. Basically, you can kick them around, shoot them, throw them off buildings, and that's, and so it's sort of like this. That that that's what that's why this game kind of is weird and it kind of creeps me out, um, and it's just something to be aware of because I had no idea about what this ragdoll posing concept was until I got this game for my son and I saw him, you know, doing that sort of stuff, and I asked him about it and he said, well, that's just kind of what you do, and and uh, and so I you know he doesn't play this anymore, but for you know for a while he was into it. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. Um, Clash of Clans, somebody asked about mobile. This is a mobile only uh, game, which is um, sort of where you, a strategy game. Um, again, this is where you're in direct combat with other players, but you can join clans and sort of you know, uh, pool resources and that kind of thing. Um, this is available on your Android, your iPhone, your iPad. Um, so this is, this is a mobile only game. Lots of opportunities for in-game purchases, so be aware for that. 
Um, League of Legends is sort of an interesting game. It's been around for a long time. Yeah. Just to go back to the plans, Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's true. So any, and especially any time you're integrating a game into a handheld device, um, it basically has hooks into uh, sort of that, that texting mechanism where you can kind of text things back and forth. Um, so that's something to be aware of too. Thank you. Uh, League of Legends has been around for a while, but it's gotten really big uh, recently. Um, it has sort of this cult following, uh, hardcore cult following, uh, where there's actually these really these high stake tournaments where there, there's real money on the line, you know, hundreds or tens of thousands of dollars to you know if you win these tournaments and things like that. Um, similar to uh, Wizards 101, except probably for older kids. Um, World of Warcraft, you've probably heard of. This is really the big one. This is the 10,000 pound gorilla in the MMORPG, which is the massive multiplayer online role-playing game world. Um, this has been around for a while. Um, it's subscription-based. I don't know how much it costs. I've never done it. Um, but again, it's like it's like D and D, and you know, you're it's you're sort of getting your you're developing your characters over time. There are parental controls available, um, but the one thing that you ought to be aware of is that there is a black market for virtual goods in the real world for World of Warcraft. There's a great, great book by Cory Doctorow called For the Win, and it sort of delves into this whole um, world of black market um, goods for gaming, like uh, for games like World of Warcraft. Um, there are literally sweatshops in China and other, uh, other countries where there are um, people sitting there, kids, like 8, 9, 10 years old, basically doing gold farming. Just basically this group of kids gets together and they have somebody who basically uh, is their boss and they go out and they gold farm and then they sell gold pieces on eBay or whatever. Um, and, uh, and, and so this is it's sort of this very interesting thing. Um, and, uh, and, and, and because of the popularity of World of Warcraft, you can go on and, and then they will meet you. You know, these black market entrepreneurs will meet you in game, transfer the gold to you, and you will release your <coughs> PayPal escrow or however they want to do it. Um, uh, very interesting uh, way to, of things are emerging. Um, EVE Online is another one. Um, this is uh, another very popular game um, with another, also has a black market uh, element to it. Um, this game, if any of you have ever used Photoshop and know sort of the level of complexity that Photoshop has, um, this is sort of the gaming equivalent of that. That it's, so, it's very, very highly complex for people with, with minds that really want that kind of thing. Um, and it's kind of interesting. So, and then you asked about um, Xbox, and I think that it's important to, to kind of talk about that. Call of Duty is um, really not for tweens. It's actually marketed with a rating M for 17 plus. But in reality, your kids are going to start lobbying you for go, uh, Call of Duty when they're like 13, 14, 15. Um, so you know that's why I put 15 plus here because you know they're they're going to lobby hard for it. Um, the thing about Call of Duty is that it has a history of controversy. Um, a few years back, there was a, uh, a, a version of a, a, the, the, uh, mo their, their Modern Warfare title. basically has a mission in it in which you are a sort of undercover operative um, who has infiltrated a uh, Russian uh, crime syndicate. And in order to prove that you were um, not an undercover operative, you had to go into an airport and shoot up a bunch of innocent civilians. So that was the gameplay. And you had to do that in the game. And so I th they backed off from that a little bit because it was so incredibly shocking. Um, and, uh, but, but still, you have to realize that this is hyper-realistic. This is hyper-realistic combat. It's, they, they've, they've based all of their weaponry on existing guns and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, I'm not going to say that, that, 
that games like this cause kids to, be, you know, uh, become violent. But um, I will say that if you decide to allow your child to use this sort of game, you need to have a conversation with them and say, um, let's talk about real versus fake violence. This is a really good book right here, Why, why Children Need Fantasy for Superheroes and Make Believe Violence. Um, you know, the military uses this sort of um, gaming for, to train soldiers. Um, there are missions in which you are flying drones and it looks exactly like it would if you were a drone operator. Um, and, uh, you know, I read an interesting uh, uh, article about a drone operator in Utah who had PTSD and, um, you know, it's, and, and one of his things that he said was it was exactly like Call of Duty. So, um, so you have to kind of do a gut check and say, what, what, you know, where do you want to go with this? Um, and yes, you go online. You, you, there are individual missions, but primarily kids like to go online and um, play this against other people. And, uh, uh, and also things like Battlefield um, and those sorts of things. So just to be aware. Uh, <laughs>